All right, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me in the back rows? All right, yep, cool. Okay, well, thank you everybody for coming out today to, to Oxford and in particular the engineering department uh, and having a look around. Uh, I see a lot of people are a little wet, but hopefully it'll, it'll kind of hold off for the rest of the day and you'll get to see some of the nicer parts of the outdoors university, the parks and all this afterward. <clears throat> so, so for background, my name is, is Harrison or Harry. I'm a, a professor here in engineering. Um, because we don't really know each other at all, I don't think I recognize a single face in the audience, uh, I thought I'd start with a little introduction on, on who I am. Uh, I'm originally from Australia. I, I was born there, grew up, and did, did my undergraduate in Australia uh, at Sydney Uni. Uh, I then moved, moved around a bit. I, I lived in the US for a while, working in engineering in Germany for a while, uh, and then eventually came to Oxford after this work to do a PhD because I wanted to, I guess, learn from the people here and also build my own skills. Uh, and since then, I've had a great time in Oxford and really liked the place. And so now I, I work here as an academic. I lead a research group working in biotechnology, which we'll hear a bit about today. Uh, but really, actually, today is, is this taster lecture, where I have three kind of goals, which are a bit tricky to put together. But we'll see how I do. So the first one is to give you some kind of background on what engineering is like these days in general and what engineers work on. Uh, the second one is to talk a little bit about what kind of thing we're working on specifically in Oxford. And the third goal is to try and tie this into exactly how, uh, as undergraduates, this would fit into your curriculum, how the skills you would learn might translate to specific engineering challenges, uh, and, and how you might work on specific things, in this case, around biotechnology and robotics. So I'm going to try and hopefully justify these three things in a short 30-minute slot. Um, but afterwards, if you have questions, I'm going to stay around and, and talk to anyone that wants to. Uh, you can ask in front of everyone else, or just come down, and we can have a chat at the front. Um, so yeah, if there's questions, write them down or something, and we can get to them at the end. But without any further introduction, let's, let's get in. So to, to start off, my, the first thing I said was we're going to try and say what we're doing in, in biotechnology and why this is an exciting area of engineering and why it might be something you might be excited about. So it really uh, is, is a very rapidly growing field. Some of you might have heard of this thing called Moore's Law, which was about how computers throughout the whole 20th century exponentially grew in their ability. So every 18 months or something, we would see that the price would go down by half I could buy a computer which was twice as good every 18 months for the same money. Uh, and particularly, I guess, for the, the parents' generation, this was huge in that we went from like the 60s where a computer was a whole room to the, the 90s where it was something in people's house. And these days, it's really in our pockets. Uh, we've, we've just kept going. And in some ways, biotechnology has done a similar thing, but starting a bit later. So in the last 20 years or so, the, the cost of, of making DNA and understanding DNA and reading DNA has been similarly having this kind of exponential growth, getting cheaper and cheaper faster and faster, and this has been pushing the technology forward ever more quickly uh, and opening up all kinds of new challenges. So we can now engineer biology to kind of work on things like waste treatment, to produce chemicals, which we couldn't otherwise do. We can make new medicines, which are personalized to people. I mean, you've seen a lot of this through COVID, where people very quickly came out with vaccines and COVID tests and rolled these out at kind of breakneck speed compared to what we would have expected uh, 10 or 20 years ago. Uh, similarly, we're working out how we can improve agriculture to make our, our environmental impact uh, reduced over time so we can grow crops more efficiently with less impact on our rivers and, and oceans, for example. And in general, we're really rapidly advancing in how we think about engineering uh, when it comes to biology. So once, a, once upon a time, biology was and kind of still is a real scientific field where it's, it's looking at nature and just seeing what we have and trying to understand it. But now we're actually translating a lot of that into engineering practice. So we're taking what we learn from nature and actually using it to build something or, or to change how it works in some way which is beneficial to our health or our environment uh, in, in many different ways. Uh, but I would also say, as a bit of a pessimist, on the whole, we also don't know what we're doing. Uh, we, we like to think that we have these new abilities. You know, I, I can understand the genome of my bacteria. or We've, we've sequenced the human, human genome about 15 years ago. Uh, but actually, we, we really don't have that good an understanding of some of these technologies and that we kind of are playing and we're testing things and but often the state of the art is I want to make my bacteria do something I'll just make a thousand different versions and then hope for the best I'll, I'll test all a thousand and you can imagine that this is is maybe working here but imagine if that was how cars were built if, if Tesla Motors would just build a thousand different cars and just try and sell them all and see how it goes I think we would think that was a very uh, chaotic way to approach business but that's kind of the stage we're in now for, for biology um, and, and so we are making some, some progress, but also our biological systems are still kind of misbehaving. You know, we have the kind of uh, uh, fictional ideas of, of Frankenstein's monster, this kind of thing where you know, biotechnology goes properly rogue. Thankfully, we, are, we aren't doing this. 
Um, but it, it's more like people are trying to understand how we could make uh, better crops, uh, which, which grow better, but we also need to be 100% confident there's no kind of dangers of these GMO technologies. So there's so much to do in terms of thinking about the safety and engineering and how we can make our new biology, uh, our new technology, much more robust and benefit, benefit everybody, really. Uh, and so really the question that comes, comes to the end of the, uh, our work is how, how can we make these biotechnologies to be reliable? So we want our, our crop to be as reliable as our car or something, and that we get in our car every day, we're happy to drive 80 miles an hour down the motorway in our car, and we kind of trust that it will work. Uh, how can we build a similar level of trust with things like a GMO crop? Because in the past, there's been all kinds of problems when people didn't really know what they were doing. Uh, and for the most part, there's not been any real disasters, but we want to make sure in the future we can really have our confidence as engineers in these kind of emerging engineering fields. So how can we do this? Well, the, the first thing that we do uh, in, in all the people working in this area in this department is really learning from nature. So if we look at how nature works to control things, in the top left here, we have an example of a, a salt crystal and some bacteria under a microscope. They kind of chase after this salt crystal. In the bottom, we have this, this eye, so it could be somebody's eye. And we see that in nature, uh, there's all these kind of control systems which, which regulate how things behave. So in the eye and in your eye, you know, if you go into a bright room, it gets, it gets uh, smaller, so it lets in less light. Whereas if you go into a dark room, it gets bigger, it lets in more light. So in this way, nature is somehow measuring what's happening and that it's measuring how much light there is and it is constricting or opening in response to that so that we can make our eyes perform well everywhere. And similarly, the bacteria do something similar at a much more molecular level where they sense things and they kind of control their own behavior uh, to try and be more reliable. So my eyes are not just a constant amount, they kind of vary over time so that no matter where I go, I can still see what's happening. And in fact, we can look at other engineering disciplines where these kind of ideas have come into play. So for example, we can think about the Industrial Revolution you know, we had these steam engines and one of the big enabling technologies that engineers came up with with James Watt, a uh, UK, uh, in, in England, came up with this fly ball governor, which were these two balls and they spin around. And so if you have a steam engine and it goes more quickly, the balls kind of come out and it slows down the steam engine. Then if it goes too slowly, they go back in and it speeds up the steam engine. And this was one of the real, uh, maybe not so glamorous looking things, but one of the fundamental technologies which allowed us to have the industrial revolution of steam because it allowed us to make steam engines which always go at the same speed, which also doesn't seem that glamorous. But in fact, if you want to make a factory that works or a manufacturing plant that works, you really need to be confident that things just kind of perform the same day in, day out. Otherwise, you know, your, your carpets will come out different sizes or something. So it's very tricky. And, and we see similar things in other areas of engineering. Imagine planes these days are very reliable because there's so much of this automatic control going on. So in some way, it's similar to nature. My plane is, is adjusting flaps so that as we go through different densities of air, the plane stays mostly level. I'm sure people have had some bad experiences now and then. Uh, in a similar way to my, my eye, which is somehow constricting uh, and opening up in response to the environment so that it works basically everywhere. So we can see, I guess, in, in parallel that on one hand, we, we observe nature to be doing some of these control things. And in engineering, we build these control things where we try and make our systems more reliable. And so then it comes to our, our challenge now in biotechnology is how we can do this uh, with the future of biotechnology. How can we make it reliable in, in a similar way by learning from nature? Uh, and we can see how this has happened in different fields. So for example, going back to this idea of the Industrial Revolution, you know, once upon a time we had steam engines and people. Uh, we then put these together to make things like cars, where we have now nature and a machine cooperating together. And by working together, they can get things done and, and it's quite reliable. And the future of this, maybe, if you, if you believe the, uh, the hype, will be self-driving cars, where now we actually allow the human to have a rest, and the human no longer has to control what's going on. Instead, the car drives itself. And so we can see this kind of idea of engineering complexity, starting with the real foundational technology, which is just the engine and a person. Uh, we then kind of had them work together, so biology and robot, or biology and car, together. And now, in fact, we have something, maybe, which is smart enough so that the human can take a break. And, and maybe the engineers will, will sit in their lab and build a car which is reliable enough that it can just take over for us. Uh, which in this case, I think would be very nice for people who spend hours commuting every day. You know, it's, it's quite tiring to sit in traffic jams. Uh, and so anyway, the, the analogy here is, is then what we're trying to do with biotechnology. You know, we start with what we have these days, which is uh, computers, which work really well, really reliably. And we have bacteria or cells or other organisms where we know kind of how they work, but we're still not very good at it. And then we come to our current stage, which is trying to link uh, biology with, with the computers or robots. 
And hopefully this will take us to a future where we can use these biotechnologies to, to treat wastewater, to treat diseases, to, to make everything much more uh, whole and, and better for the environment so that we can actually uh, not have such a bad impact on our world. So hopefully we can see there's some kind of analogy here. We're still, I guess, in the middle stage in, in biotechnology, whether our, whereas our cars are more at the later stage. Um, but hopefully we can move forward towards a, a more exciting future where we can actually really be engineers that work with these very complex natural technologies and get the most out of them. So that was a very brief kind of background on, on some tech challenges in bi biotechnology and I suppose kind of why we care in that these are very uh, integral technologies to our daily lives. You know, we eat every day, we, we drink clean water every day and it's important that we can do this uh, as the population of the world grows and, and potentially climate change puts some things out of whack. Uh, so now on to briefly some, some challenges that we're working on and people in this department are working on and we can think about how these actually tie into the kind of day-to-day -day skills we have as engineers to analyze uh, things, to use mathematics to understand nature and so on. So second dot point. Um, so going back to this diagram, it was from the previous slide, if, if we think about how we're going to be engineers, we're going to build something, we have to think about all the different parts that go into any system. So if I make a car, you know, we have to, have to think about the engine, we have to think about the, the seats, we have to think about the brakes. Uh, similarly, with biotechnology, we have to think about how these different things will interplay. So we have somewhere at the bottom some biological components, so some cells and things are happening in biology where the cells are producing chemicals and proteins and, and so on. Uh, then we're going to somehow measure what they do. We're going to observe or something. We're going to see how many there are. We're going to see how they're behaving. At some point, this will then go into a computer. The computer is going to then try and calculate what it should do next. Uh, and then based on what the computer thinks, we're going to somehow, again, control the biology. So this kind of goes in a circle. You could imagine a, a different conceptualization where the biology is a person and the top thing is a car. And then it would be like the, the person is reading the dials of, of the car and that they're, they're observing what's happening. Uh, they're thinking uh, and then they're, they're controlling the steering wheel. So in that way, you have this kind of exchange of information between the biology and the, and the robot or machine. Uh, but what does this actually look like? So I guess I've been quite conceptual so far. I've just been telling you about what uh, the broad picture is, but as, as engineers and undergrads, you mean the, an important part of the work is getting your hands dirty and actually doing some things yourself. So what would this actually look like in practice? Let's start with the biological components down the bottom. So I said that we, we've been going out for decades now and understanding biology and trying to learn from it. But how do we actually do that? Well. We, we usually start by actually just going out into nature. So it could be a, a nice exotic forest. It could be something less glamorous, like just going out here and taking some samples from the soil in the park. Uh, in fact, both would give us a huge diversity of biological information. So really, there's, there's a lot to be learned everywhere. I mean, there's people doing science studying what lives under toilet seats, and, and they do find some very important things which have big implications for human health. So perhaps it's not always as glamorous as a nice mossy rock, but nevertheless, we, we find some useful parts, we study some useful biology. We, we then take some information from biology. So for this might be we take some DNA out of the cells we find in, in our forest or in, in our dirt. Uh, we then put these together into something like a biological program. So this is getting a bit advanced here. Don't worry too much about the details, but it's like we've gone out, we've found some information, we've found uh, let's say I found a bacteria and I've understood how this bacteria produced this important chemical and I, I can then see what exactly it's doing and I can then assemble these somehow into a, a, a program which I can then put into a different cell so I can then go to my factory and I can say cells please could you produce insulin or something insulin is uh, a product which is important for diabetics and in fact it's almost entirely produced by bacteria since the, the 80s a company discovered how to do this and reprogram bacteria for it uh, so in some sense, this is the kind of thing we're doing as engineers to, to build biology. We're, we're finding things from nature, we're learning from nature, and we're hopefully taking the best things and allowing us to advance our technology in beneficial ways. Uh, that was the, the cell part of my diagram. If I think about the other part with the computer, uh, it maybe looks a bit different. So in this case, we're building robots. I have one here actually as a, a demonstration. You can have a look later. Um, so we're, we're trying to make new ways to interface with biology. So I might put my cells in my test tube. I have a little thing for stirring them at the bottom. Then I put them into my, my box. In fact, you can't really see what's going on inside this, but it's, it's heating things. It's measuring light and, and, and different spectral properties of what's in this test tube. Uh, it's, it's stirring it. It's adding some chemicals over time. And so our robots in, in biotechnology are often not as glamorous as like a walking man robot with hands or something. Uh, it's kind of like the robots are in, in, in boxes and there's liquids moving around and things getting heated and lights shining and measuring how different things beh behave. And so this is something we've developed in the last few years in this department with 
help of a lot of different students and people working together to make this kind of platform where we can then, uh, uh, you know, put my bacteria into a t into a test tube, and then I, I have my computer which runs this for a week or something and understands what's going on and, and tries to understand how the bacteria is behaving over time. And so it's, it's somehow robotics. It's, it's building its electrical engineering, its software engineering, its control engineering, um, but not with a with hands or something. And so so now I guess we've seen a little bit about how you know this, this biology happens, what the robots might look like. So let's try and think of an example challenge uh, of how we might actually apply this. Uh, and we'll think about how as engineers we might approach it from, from a mathematical standpoint because uh, we wanted to have a little bit of mathematics in the lecture just to uh, scare people off, I suppose. Um, so we'll put that in now. So anyway, so we know biological systems evolve. So think a, a very topical one at the moment is, is, is COVID-19 strain evolution in that we, we every, every few months, you know, Delta comes out and Omicron comes out. And it's not as if someone's making these somewhere, but it's, it's like the, the, the bacteria is circulating in our population. And, and sometimes when it's replicating itself, it makes a mistake uh, in that the DNA changes a little bit. But sometimes that actually makes it a stronger virus. Uh, and then it can propagate this, this strengthened virus, and then we get a new, a new variant, which often I think a lot of us were previously despairing of because it meant there will be a new lockdown or something. Now it seems as if we don't do that anymore. So I guess people are not quite so uh, worried about it. But, it. but in general, we have this process where over time the virus changes, and, and similar things are what we see in bacteria. So, for example, the bacteria living in oceans have slowly been evolving in response to climate change as sea temperatures increase. Uh, in, in practice, they're not really doing it that quickly, which is a big problem for corals and other ecosystems. Uh, but we want to understand this to some extent. We want to be able to say, like, if I have a test tube like this one here, I'm going to put a bunch of cells in here, so like billions of cells. You can put lots of them because they're microscopic. Um, over time, some of them will change. Some of them will start doing something different to their neighbors just because of random variations which get propagated over time. Uh, and so they'll behave differently. So let's say I have these... Um, what have we got? Uh, seven cells, eight cells. So there's, there's three which are full green and, and, and five which are, which are white. Uh, and so over time, maybe the full green ones behave a little better. And so then they grow faster than the other cells. And so this would mean that they're selecting for those winners. We've, some of them are slightly better than the other ones. And so over time, they will grow and kind of slowly take over. And so our engineering question would be, how would we... Well, to first, to first begin, we'd want to study this process and just observe what's going on. Uh, the second thing would be how do we actually control this as engineers? How do we build a system so that we can maybe make it go faster or slower or understand exactly what will happen? And so this is really obvious, the, the application, thinking back to this COVID-19 strain evolution, you know, if I want to understand uh, approximately how long it will take till the next variant comes out or how could I slow down the next variant from coming out, uh, we really need to understand how we would model this system and then it would advise us on how we should, for example, make public policy or, or, or medical policy to, to try and change how these things happen. Uh, so it does kind of sound like a medical question, but actually ultimately often comes down to engineers to try and, try and figure out how we would test these things and actually do them in reality. So let's think of this particular example, cells in a test tube. I'll start off with my cells and my test tube thing. So one of these little guys and a test tube with, with some cells in it. Uh, so to begin with, we just have these two things, and now we have to link them. Uh, so thinking back to my diagrams before, I had this loop going around. So the first thing would be we have to figure out some way to measure what's going on. So in this device, it could be looking at how many cells there are, or how fast they're growing, or whether they're green or yellow or something like this. Uh, and we can measure that over time. We can see what's happening. We then have to think of how we're going to control them. So in this case, uh, we might, for example, feed them so that we can make them keep growing over time. We just keep adding food so they keep growing because there's always food, they always grow. Uh, alternatively, what we might do is apply some radiation. So uh, in here, there's also a UV uh, LED, so we can apply some ultraviolet radiation, which in fact encourages our cells to mutate and do this evolution thing. Uh, and so we have these different dials as engineers that we could be turning to try and change how the biology behaves in our experiment. Uh, in, in this particular case, if we have this UV radiation, well, what happens is we know from our studies of biology that if we apply UV, will cause some damage to the DNA in my cells, will cause them to be stressed because they don't like having their DNA damage. It's somehow similar to sunburn. You know, if you go outside and get too much UV, your cells will go red because they're not enjoying that damage. And in this case, kind of similar to sunburn, actually, they'll, they'll mutate. In sunburn, some might know, and from Australia, this is a much more important thing, perhaps in the UK, uh, the skin cancer is very prevalent because you can get mutations in DNA which turn up because of uh, way too much UV radiation. And so we see something similar in our cells. We, we apply UV, and so over time they'll get stressed and they'll mutate, and that means they'll change their behavior slightly. So they might 
for example, become more resistant to UV, they might no longer be worried by UV. So let's go through and think about how, as engineers, we would actually try and make, a, for example, a mathematical description of this. So we have this kind of complicated thing. Uh, we're going to go through kind of a, a model building process, which will be a bit complex, but I mean, the, the goal of this uh, talk is to try and show you what engineering is like in practice. So it would be uh, remiss of me not to actually put some equations in your face. Um, so we'll start with this idea. We have something, we have some cells. Currently, we have uh, eight of them, I think. And so the first thing I might say would be n. I'm going to make a number. That's the size of my population. So currently, it's eight. It would go up over time because they would grow. Uh, but this is something I could measure. I can see what's happening. Uh, the next thing that I mentioned before, what was going to happen as we applied UV was they were going to get stressed. Uh, and so maybe I'll make another parameter D, which will be DNA damage or stress. So as I add UV, my cells are going to be more and more unhappy about it because the UV is hitting their DNA and, and causing problems at the chemical level. Uh, the next thing I might say is that, in fact, you know, I, I, I'm causing them stress, but cells are somehow able to deal with this to some extent. And so maybe I'll make a parameter called alpha, which is how, how good they are at coping with the stress. So if they've got a really big value of alpha, it's like my cells can repair the stress. They can repair the DNA damage really quickly. Uh, they're very resilient. Uh, but if they had a very small value, then they would die very quickly because they're getting stressed and they're not good at dealing with it, and so they die. Uh, and so we have these kind of different, this different parameters coming in. We can think about what else we would have in here. We might have my, my amount of UV radi radi radiation would be U, so that's just how much I'm sending in here from my, from my machine. Uh, and the very last one would just be the feeding rate. So this is the yellow over here. We're just going to keep adding food to my population so they keep growing. Uh, we don't want them to die out, so we're just going to keep chucking in some food there over time. So, so they'll, they'll just stay growing. Even though they're stressed, they'll stay, keep growing to some extent. So that's a bunch of equations. Um, well, sorry, that's a bunch of uh, definitions. Let's get to some more scary equations. So I won't go through, because we don't really have time, how we actually would build a model like this from scratch. But I hope you'll take it on faith that we could, in fact, combine these different uh, five different numbers uh, and, and make a differential equation model, which I think many people should have seen in the last couple of years of school of some variety or another. So this will be a, a medium complexity one. We've got three differential equations. Here's the equations, the only ones you'll see, so don't stress too much. Uh, keep your, yeah, your stress levels down. Um, and, and so we can make three equations so we can try and model what's going to happen in this whole system. So uh, they're kind of modeling three separate processes. The first one would be my population. So this is how many cells I have. So it says DNDT, which means the rate of change of the number of cells, is somehow a function of the number of cells n. There's some function here of D, which was my, my stress level, uh, and delta, so that's how much food I'm giving. So somehow if I add more food, they'll, they'll grow. Uh, then I have this middle equation, which is, which is about the stress. And so somehow the, uh, the, the amount of stress D, uh, DD, DT, uh, it goes up if I apply U. So it's saying if I add UV, they get more stressed. I think that makes sense. And it's also going down with the minus sign depending on alpha. So it's saying if, if I'm really good at repairing my stress, then I'll overall have less stress. You don't need to worry too much about this. We're just going to kind of explain very briefly what's going on. Uh, and the very last one is the actual evolution which is happening, which is over time, my cells will get better at dealing with UV because over time, I've exposed them to more and more. And so this idea whereby the ones which are good at dealing with UV will grow faster than the ones which are not good at dealing with UV. And so over time, the whole test tube will get better at dealing with UV. So I'll end up with some cells which are really resistant to sunburn. Uh, in this case, bacteria, maybe not so useful, but for, for people that would be very useful uh, if, if you could just be completely resilient to UV. Uh, anyway, so we can think about maybe a little bit about, about what this means. So this term here, I said I wouldn't justify in detail, but we can see that if, if, if this D would be a big number, in fact, my growth would go down. So it's kind of saying that as, as the amount of stress increases and increases, my cells slow down their growth because they're not happy, they're stressed. Uh, and, and similarly, there's some kind of relationship between these other two equations in terms of DNA repair and mutation, but we won't go into this in detail. But let's just try and think about what these equations would actually look like if I was to plot them. So I've just, the same, same thing as before on the right, on the left, we're just going to make some plots, which I've covered up most of them to begin with. So let's say what I'm going to do in my experiment is at time one, I'm going to apply some UV. So I don't know if you can quite see the other side of that U, but it basically says the U goes to 0 0.1 at a, at a certain time. Uh, and so what I'm going to think about next is, is this, uh, this one here, which is D. Uh, what do we think would happen with D according to these equations if I would put in some U? 
uh, intuitively you can think about it based on my explanation. Anyone have a guess? Yeah? Uh, the stress will increase. Yes, the stress will increase. Um, that seems reasonable, yeah, because I'm, I, I start off with D is zero, because we can see it's zero here. Uh, I'm going to put in a U, which is some positive number, so D, 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 T will be positive. It's going to go up. Uh, and yes, indeed, we see it does go up, although it's going to then go down in this case. Um, what do we think next about um, M? So that's uh, this one here. Whoops, I've got two cursors now. So this N here, it starts at 1 in that we start with a full maximum number of cells. What do we think will happen uh, in terms of N according to these equations if, if D goes up? Any guesses? Yep. It will decrease. Yeah, exactly, it'll decrease. So. To begin with, we just had d equals 0, so for this we would just get 2 minus 1 equals 1, so nothing will happen. But then d is, is now some positive number, so this, this term here is going to get smaller, and so as you said, n will go down. So again, it goes down for a little while, uh, and then eventually it recovers. Uh, and then maybe, I mean, this recovery thing looks nice in that they're getting better. Like, they've, we've added uv. Originally, they were unhappy, right? We added it and they died, but now they've kind of come back. Uh, so what do we think might be happening with this alpha at the bottom? Remembering this was somehow my ability to deal with uh, my, my UV. Yep. It's increasing. Yes, increasing. And we can also see this uh, just by looking at this equation in that this has got, uh, you know, alpha is positive, n is positive, this is positive, and this will be positive unless d is some massive, uh, uh, actually it will always be positive. So basically alpha can't go down, so it will have to go up. So indeed we see alpha does go up. Uh, and so we have this kind of relation between these, these equations, you know, we come in as engineers and we try and make these models of, of natural systems and we try and understand them so we can understand how to engineer them. Uh, and somehow we've made this model and maybe it's convincing. And in fact, if we go and do this in an experiment, the model, so this is just plotting n, the number of cells we can see on the left is my models. On the right is my experiment where I've actually gone with a bunch of these things and done exactly this experiment. I've put in some UV at a certain time and they, they match pretty well. I mean, the, the one where we put in a very small amount of UV, so one times UV at the top, um, basically they don't care. It's only a tiny amount. They just keep growing fine. If we put in 10 times UV, we see that the number of cells goes down and then comes back up. If we put in 100 times UV, that's actually too much for them to recover from, and so we kill them. Uh, they all die in, in this thing, but I mean, it's, it's only bacteria. There's millions of them, so we're not too, too worried. Um, yeah, so in somehow we've seen We've, we've made this mathematical model. It worked pretty well. It, it kind of showed that, like our, our theory of what was going to happen in that there would be this DNA damage, then there will be this stress, then there will be this recovery. Our mathematical model confirmed that. Uh, and then the reality actually looked very similar to the mathematical model, which is always good for engineers. I mean, in, in, sometimes you make a model and then reality is absolute carnage, and then you despair and go back to your library and try and think about it again. Uh, in this case, it worked pretty well. Um, and, and so we could then use this to predict how nature might evolve. So I was talking about the COVID evolution. I mean, this is not a model of COVID, but it, it's, it's very applicable in some similar ways. For our particular work, what we're actually trying to understand is how things like antibiotic resistance evolve. So that's one of the things that we're working on here uh, with many of the students. And so that's where we might have UV and we might have antibiotics and they kind of work together. And so over time, the bacteria become more and more resistant to an antibiotic. And as engineers, we're trying to figure out how we could, for example, uh, design a, a treatment schedule or a different antibiotic that we could build so it would be more difficult for our cells to take over and, and defeat that antibiotic. Uh, and so very much uh, towards the end now, just finishing up, we're thinking about how these things I've talked about would fit within the undergraduate curriculum. So we've kind of gone through some things of robotics and biotechnology, but how would that actually look like in, in the daily life of an engineer here? So I thought I'd bring examples for things that I personally teach in, in the four different years, just because those are the most familiar to me, but in practice there's also a huge diversity of other projects that one might work on as an undergrad. Uh, for first year, I, I do a lot of teaching in mathematics, so this is things like these differential equation models we talked about. So this is in a course called P1, which is the kind of bread and butter mathematical course that everyone starts on. And so then the kind of questions we might be asking in this direction would be if we have a model like this, how do we analyze what it will do? Uh, can, I, can I tell what this will do in the future? How do I design the model? How do I, how do I plot it? How do I simulate it in a computer? Uh, so these kind of fundamental questions, which are in this case relevant for this evolution thing I've talked about. In practice, it's re relevant for basically all of engineering. You need to know this math. For second year, uh, another lecture course that I, that I give that I see many of the students in is, is, is called in discrete control. And so, so somehow this is about designing control systems like this bioreactor or, or like uh, a thermostat in your house or like an airplane 
uh, how do we actually build a control system in reality? So how do I build a system which measures something, decides what to do, and then actually actuates the system? So the examples we often have are things like this. Often we have a, a lab where students fly around quadcopters or little remote control cars. And the idea is we try to build control systems whereby my car gets steered by a computer and I have to program the computer how to steer the car. And so that's a second year course, which is, is again, quite mathematical, but also quite applied. Uh, in third year, uh, getting a bit more into the real project courses, one that I run is, is this biomedical feedback control systems. So in this case, it's going beyond just bacteria. We're building kind of technologies which interface with humans. So in this case, it was an early sketch from one of the students' projects this year. They were building a mouth guard to help with sleep apnea. So what it would do would measure if you were having a sleep apnea event by listening with a microphone. And if you were, it would give you a very slight electrical shock in the roof of your mouth, uh, which probably doesn't sound, that, doesn't sound that nice. But in fact, if it's a very small enough shock, uh, people can keep sleeping, and it just kind of jig, uh, rejigs their, their throat muscles, and it helps them not have uh, this, this very important problem, which is often one which we don't really have good treatments for. Uh, so this is just an example of a kind of project course. Again, it's this control engineering and robotics thing in that we're building a device which is measuring, deciding, and then actuating somehow. Uh, in this case, a mouth guard, so quite different to a bioreactor, but nevertheless, a very interesting challenge. And in the last year, the fourth year, uh, as you may hear today, there's a lot of electives, but also a big part is the students' fourth year projects. And so an example in this, I've put up a whole poster here from a student from my group this year, Ben Kay, in the top left, who is building a different kind of bioreactor, which was which is quite a small thing, but it's made out of lots of layers of plastic. You can see there's uh, 12 layers or something. Uh, and it's, it's like liquids move around inside this big chip. And we, we look at it with a scanner to take images of where the cells are. And over time, we can pump in and pump out different liquids to grow cells in different chambers. So this was a project the student did during the year. You know, he sat down and he first he designed this on a computer. So he had to design all these layers. Then he actually built it using a laser cutter in the department. And then in our lab, we did the software engineering to make this kind of imaging system where we would take pictures of the cells and then process it automatically. Uh, and then we could actually grow bacteria in it. And so there's some studies here where he's been doing it on a bench down in one of the labs to grow bacteria over time and understand how they behave in different environments. So yeah, that's, that's an example of, I guess, the, towards the end of someone's degree where they have a lot of freedom. You get the whole year to work on a project of your choosing. Uh, and it's, it's quite independent, but you have a supervisor who then helps you with the technical things and the big picture thinking. But ultimately, it's up to you to do the design and building yourself. And it's a really great experience to actually get hands-on experience building things from, from scratch. So that just about brings me out of time into the very summary. Uh, so hopefully I've somewhat convinced you today that biotechnology is an exciting field. There's a lot going on in this area. Uh, in Oxford in particular, we have a lot of research which is bringing together the kind of traditional engineering, control engineering, and, and software with things like robotics, mathematics, and this kind of engineering biology idea. Uh, and also there's many opportunities here for undergraduate students, both from the fundamental courses to learn the fundamental math and, and science behind these fields, all the way through to the project courses where you actually build some of these things and test them out for yourself. Uh, and so with that, I'm at time, so thank you all very much for coming today. Happy to take any questions. <laughs>